Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lauren, and this is Hidden in Plain Sight, the stories of the Painted Hall virtual experience with the Old Royal Naval College. And it's brought to you by Tickets Awakenings Week. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tickets Awakening Weeks is a six week celebration of the reopening of museums and attractions in six countries around the world. Um, the venues participating in Awakening Weeks have worked day and night to reimagine their experiences and introduce new hygiene measures to make it super safe for you to visit again. And they're also rolling out the welcome mat for those of you who aren't able to travel online, who aren't able to travel yet with these online experiences. Um, so this is it. Glad to have you all here. And um, before I hand over to our lovely tour guides for the afternoon, we've just got a couple of logistics to take care of. Um, first of all, if you have any questions for the presenters, you can submit them through our little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Um, there'll also be, so there'll be a Q&A at the end of the tour, so just feel free to submit your questions throughout and we're going to answer as many as possible at the end of the session. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar. Um, your camera's not on, um, but you can use the chat to communicate with your fellow attendees and with the speakers as well. Um, you can also share yeah, where you're joining from in the reactions and the comments. Um, and you can share that with all panelists and attendees. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, you can just use the chat to send a message to all panelists um, and we'll try and help you out as soon as possible. And if you're having trouble with any audio, you can just leave and rejoin. That's usually an easy fix. Um, finally, this presentation is recorded and we're going to be sending the recording to all registrants after this. Um, so without any further ado, I'm happy to hand over to our host for this virtual experience, um, Michelle Stapleton and Bruce Pierce, and they're going to transport us to the world of the Old Royal Naval College. So Michelle and Bruce, please take it away. Hello, my name is Michelle. I'm a volunteer guide here. And I'm with Bruce and I are going to tell you some lovely stories about some of the people in, on this beautiful, in the beautiful hall and in the paintings. So, the founders of the hospital were William III and Mary II. After the Battle of La Hogue in 1692, we have lots and lots of injured seamen. And Mary is so distressed that she wants to show the nation's gratitude. So she asked Sir Christopher Wren to build a hospice for injured seamen. Originally, it was not an official site for physically sick. It was more like an almshouse or a retirement home for injured seamen. And they were known as the Greenwich pensioners. You must imagine that when they arrived here, this, this was some magnificent architecture here. And for nearly 51 years, this was a building site. But one of the pensioners who can show some light on, on how they had their lives here is depicted here up on the ceiling by the artist James Thornhill as winter. <clears throat> His name was John Worley. He was mentioned in the uh, council minutes nearly nine times because, ladies and gentlemen, he's our naughty boy of the ceiling. He was always drunk and disorderly, not going to chapel, swearing and trying to sneak the ladies <clears> in. It was run on naval lines, but there was no flogging. So there was, um, uh, they were stopped their liberty to ensure good conduct. But so what were the penalties? Well, the penalties were in the confinement house for four days, loss of liberty, bread and water, sat on a high dais in the downing hall so everybody could see they'd been naughty, and not allowed to leave the hospital. But also, ladies and gentlemen, they had to wear naughty coats. Naughty coats were bright yellow. And if you saw a pensioner in a naughty coat with long red sleeves, you knew he'd been drunk on a Sunday. Now, Wally had been at sea for 70 years and he lived to the right old age of 96. He was born in Wales, and we think he, he started his uh, working life in the coal trade, but ended up in the Royal Navy. So what else happened here? Well, um, they were given, the food here was plentiful. They were given three meals a day and four pints of beer a day. And every pensioner was given uh, a, a weekly allowance of a shilling to buy more, well, to buy tobacco. When they arrived, they were shaved, washed and clothed given neckties, head nightcaps, and bedding, as well as their uniform. But they had, um, it was a large staff here. So what they had was under the captains and the lieutenants, 
we had senior pensioners who were called boatswains. These were boatswains who were in charge of the wards and of the part of the dining hall. And they also had with them um, to help them mates. These were, these were given extra pocket money to help with, what them, with the wards and in the dining hall. So at any one time, there would have been 3,000 pensioners here. And so that's just a small insight into the number of the people that were here from 1705 until 1869. I'm now going to hand you over to Bruce. Thank you very much, Michelle. And let me extend to you a very warm welcome to the Painted Hall here at the old Royal Naval College in Greenwich. So, what is this place in which we find ourselves? The Painted Hall at the old Royal Naval College. Well, sometimes people call it Britain's answer to the Sistine Chapel. And fundamentally, I'll tell you something about um, the function of this place, the original function. Founded by William and Mary, William III and Mary II, as Michelle's already mentioned. But what was this room, this particular room? Well, this room, this block, was finished by the famous architect Christopher Wren in the year 1704. And it, this room, what is now known as the Painted Hall, was always meant to be the refectory. This is where the admiral in charge and the Greenwich pensioners would eat their breakfasts, their lunches and their dinners. And at first that was fine. But as this grand interior decoration got underway by the artist Sir James Thornhill, incidentally the first British artist to get knighted, as it got well underway and gathered steam between 1707 up to 1726, the Greenwich pensioners felt less and less comfortable eating in such grand surroundings. In the end, they started eating downstairs in the plain old undercroft. That's where they ate their meals, their breakfast, their lunches and their dinners. It's as if they preferred the fish and chip shop to the Savoy Grill. They just didn't feel comfortable eating in these grand surroundings. So what is this work, this grand interior decoration all about? What is the story which the artist Sir James Thornhill paints? And really it's a story stretching from the vestibule, which is the old entrance to the painted hall, stretching across the main room, the largest room, which is the lower hall, into the upper hall beyond. And he paints a story and the story I describe as this, it's really the story of a nation on the up and up, a nation beginning to flex its muscles in the world. And the story begins with a desire to start to dominate the sea lanes of the world, but that involves better navigation. There's all sorts of disasters at sea, not just in Britain, but in every country, loads and loads of terrible disasters. And Britain's gonna make a stab at getting the best navigation possible. Hence, a giant investment in science. Hence also, of course, the Royal Observatory further up in Greenwich Hill, in Greenwich Park. It's all part of that quest for better navigation. So there's a giant investment in science, which is celebrated here inside the Painted Hall. In particular, a, an investment into astronomy. But it's not just science, of course. Then Britain begins to dominate the sea lanes of the world. And of course, this is a Royal Naval establishment, so it's a celebration of the Royal Navy and also a corresponding growth in a commercial navy going out to all four corners of the globe, bringing back more trade and wealth back to the home country. But the home country all controlled under a new governmental system, Protestant constitutional monarchy. What do I mean by constitutional monarchy? Well, brought across by William III, of course, from Holland. And by constitutional monarchy, I mean a government which is also involves the rule of parliament. So completely different to the rest of Europe, apart from Holland, it's a giant step forward in terms of democracy. And all these great ideas, these great themes are celebrated here inside the Painted Hall. From the vestibule, which is the entrance, sweeping across the lower hall into the upper hall beyond. I'll draw your attention now to the eastern part of the lower hall.
sorry everyone it looks like we've got a slight issue with our um with it looks like they've got a small issue with their um internet we're just going to take a few minutes to try and get them back in please be patient with us own sun other planets do exactly the same thing and then of course other solar systems are discovered as well Galileo agreed with Copernicus but he was imprisoned for his views because think about the implications or rather the ramifications of what I've just said because if pre, -pre Copernican theory the earth was the center of the universe it also means that we mankind is also at the center of the universe and fundamentally uh, Copernicus is, Copernicus is coming along and he's saying something utterly and completely different. He's saying, no, 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 mankind is but a cog in the machine. So it stands everything on its head, all types of rational thought, scientific thought, philosophical thought, religious thought, spiritual thought. It's the way we think automatically today, but um, we have Copernicus to thank for that, or maybe not to thank for that, depending upon our point of view. Let's introduce you to another famous scientist, in the bottom right hand corner, Sir John Flamsteed with his assistant Thomas Weston. And there he is. Of course, he's the first astronomer royal. He does most of his work on Greenwich Hill at the Royal Observatory. And the man is a perfectionist. In fact, just below him is a scroll. And on the scroll, there's a prediction. It's a prediction of a solar eclipse. And it is an actual prediction because it says 1715 on the scroll that this section of the lower hall, this eastern section, was finished in the year 1713. So it is actually a prediction. And I'm happy to say that he got his prediction right. Although he was seven minutes out with his calculations, which was no good for the perfectionist Sir John Flamsteed, he was livid with himself. There's one scientist, arguably the most famous scientist of the lot, who's not really celebrated here big time inside the Painted Hall. And that is Sir Isaac Newton. And there's a reason for that. The reason being because the king was putting pressure on Sir John Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal, and he was saying, get your material, get your data published, get it out onto British warships and British commercial shipping as quickly as possible. And he said, no, only when my data is perfect. And he resisted the king, a very dangerous thing to do. So the king put uh, pressure on other scientists, notably on Sir Isaac Newton and Sir Edmund Halley, who later becomes an astronomer royal in his own right. He put pressure on those two scientists. They managed to get hold of his data um, they published out under Flamsteed's name that that wasn't the point. Flamsteed was not ready to publish. He rushed out, he brought up as many books as possible, and he burned the lot. Now, the interesting thing is he was particularly angry, livid with Sir Isaac Newton. But also what's interesting is that maybe Sir John Flamsteed and the artist Sir James Thornhill, who did all this, they might have been good mates together in the same Freemasons London Lodge. So it's reckoned between themselves they decided that Sir Isaac Newton was not going to be celebrated here inside the Painted Hall. Michelle, I'll hand over to you once again. Thank you. We're now going to look at the lower end of the hall. We're going to look at the arch at the lower end. I'm just waiting for us to move over so I can start telling you about the arch. This is very similar to the arch at the other end that Bruce was talking about with the raised arch because this ceiling is completely flat and he's, this is what we call trompe l'oeil. Trompe l'oeil has, and he's raised it up so that we're raising up under the arch. This story tells a very different story as well as science, geography, navigation. It also shows us the city of London. So we have the city of London. We have a, firstly in the middle, we have a British man of warship called renamed HMS Blenheim after the Duke of Marlborough's world land victory in 1704. Below on the deck we have all the spoils of war and on the right hand side we have the, French, the winged figure of victory holding the French flags. 
we have the red ensign flying and the gun ports open ready to fire. So what does this tell us? What this tells us is firstly in the middle we have a young woman holding a sword resting on a shield. She represents the city of London. The city of London creates the wealth. Below her we have three rivers, very important rivers. All the important rivers are shown on the ceiling here because they are dominating and bringing in our trade. The gentleman with the reeds in his hair and the swirling green um, cloth around him obviously is our River Thames. Now, just think about it for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. The River Thames would have been very dirty and smelly in those days. It wasn't the best of places to be near. But the other, the other river that is very important to us is the gentleman resting on his arm next to the River Thames, and that's the River Tyne, coal from Newcastle. Coal was taxed <coughs> to fund the Navy, and the coal tax here helped to build this hospital. Leaning on the balustrade, we have some other important, like Bruce was saying, scientists and mathematicians and astronomers. So firstly, we have a celestial being leaning on the globe, holding up a gold armillary spear. Next to here, we have quite an important mathematician. We have Archimedes with his theory. And if we come back to this corner, we have um, another bit of navigation and geography in the middle here. We, she's leaning, she has a compass on a celestial globe, and we have what she's holding, what looks like a television aerial. This is a cross staff. And this is what they used to navigate to find latitude before they had the Harrison's watch to correct longitude. And in the corner here, we have Galileo with his telescope. And as Bruce said, he agreed with Copernicus about the sun being the center of the universe, but he was also a mathematician and scientist. And he's holding the telescope to his left eye because he was blind in his right eye. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go up to the other part of the hall. Here we are at the north wall. This is the north wall. But before we say, before I tell you about the North Wall, I just want to reiterate some of the, what Bruce has said. The artist was James Thornhill, and he was given the commission to paint the painted hall. He was told to show peace and liberty over tyranny, succession of monarchs and naval supremacy. And it's all up there on our ceilings. In the center of the lower hall are William III and Mary II. These are the founders of the hospital, but in Mary and William have no descendants. So in 1701, the act of, they, they passed an act that we had to have a Protestant succession to the throne. Her sister Anne takes the throne, who is up here in the ceiling above us, with her husband, George of Denmark, the right high admiral, but he was also a governor of the hospital. But they had 18 babies and none of them survived. So they had to look further afield. And further afield we find George I, George I of the Hanoverians, and here he is depicted arriving at Greenwich in 1714. This technique that you can see here is called Grisille. This is painted mostly in grey, but to imitate sculpture. So George is arriving in Greenwich in 1714 with his two mistresses. 18 chefs and no wife. No wife because she had committed adultery. She was locked in a castle in Hanover and that's where she stayed until she died. So we see Thornhill had to prepare cut, cut sketches and designs to show to the commissioners for them to approve. And these sketches and designs with notes by his own hand can still seem, be seen today in the British Museum. But here we see Thornhill navigating the fraught party politics of the 18th century. We also see him aware of political function and propaganda <coughs> value of decorative painting. So when he first painted or designed this wall here, he wanted to show the scene as it was, but he realized that depicting it realistically would be political propaganda, political, uh, sorry, political, 
disaster to the future. So what he decided was the commissioners had asked him to show pictorial and political uniformity. And so he decided to eliminate all reference to the actual scene and adopt an, an apologetical approach. So now I'm going to explain the wall to you. So firstly, we have how Thornhill represented it. We have George arriving at Greenwich in a sacred car. Next to him, we have peace. And in his left, his left side, we have happiness. Above him, we have eternity with the crown. And here we have fame sounding his praise. Here we have St. George astride the horse, trampling the dragon to represent Popery. He is being led by truth with the light, justice with the scales, religion with the incense, and of course the red cap of liberty. And cowering here in the corner is the Jacobite rebellion. And here behind us is the Royal Hospital. So, he decides in his notebook that he will change and write down his objections on what he proposes to do. So what he does is he, he takes away, because it was night and dark, he takes away that scene completely. He takes away the ship that the king has arrived on and he then asks who should accompany him because there was a large, large crowd and he is not happy with the way the king is dressed. And he doesn't think that it's right for him to, prosper, to put him into prosperity to the future looking the way he does. So what does he do? Well, he creates an evening sun, he eliminates the ship, and he takes away the crowd. So he takes away the crowd and he puts the king in Roman uh, attire to say that he looks as he should be, not as he was. So these fascinating insights into the, of the mind of the, of the artist shows us how he wants us to tell, how he wanted to present history. But the painted hall itself was already a, a, a tourist attraction. But in, in 1726, Thornhill had prepared an explanation booklet so that the people from the 18th century could understand the symbolism of the paintings in the hall. And it was his way of telling history the way he wanted to tell it. Thank you very much, Michelle. <clears throat> and I'll continue with the Hanoverian story as Michelle's introduced you to um, George I. And in fact, he is in the center of the West Wall, which is before us. At the end of the upper hall, there is George the First in the center of the West Wall. And I'm going to describe everything around him, this whole West Wall feature, which I sometimes describe as a piece of Hanoverian propaganda in many ways. Let me explain. This is an imaginary scene because all these characters that you see before you, the real life characters, they wouldn't have been all together at the same time. They'd have been there at different periods, different different chronology entirely. But also, this sort of painting was done even in Tudor times, really to reinforce the idea of the Tudor succession and the Protestant succession. And this is very much part of the same style by the artist Sir James Thornhill, who incidentally has painted himself into the picture. There he is, standing there in a so-called gentlemanly pose of the period. He's wearing a red sash across his body. He was that first British artist to get knighted, there's a palette by his side indicating his profession. And he's painted himself into the picture. But let's get back to this main picture of the West Wall. Hanover in propaganda. And uh, Thornhill, he takes his cue to some degree perhaps from the Tudors. This idea of reinforcing the idea of an act of succession. Because when George of Hanover, when he came across to become George the first of England, he wasn't very popular. He made several, well, some people might say errors. For example, he didn't speak very good English. He didn't make much, um, much effort in trying to improve the situation either. So he was criticized for that. Um, he used to run back to Germany for six weeks at a stretch during the summer months. 
So he was criticized for that and many other things besides. So here he's getting back at his critics to some degree or another. There's George once again, but by his side is his grandson. Uh, by his side on the right, the, and um, by his side his son, the future George II. They're looking away from each other because they couldn't bear each other in real life. Loads of grandchildren at his feet. And at the very top of the upper hall, a Latin inscription. And the translation rings, a new generation descends from the heavens. A new generation descends from the heavens. So this man is making a statement, in fact. He's saying, I'm not one man, I'm not just one king. We are a dynasty, the Hanoverian dynasty, and we're here to stay. There's other things you could read into this West War. It's very, very interesting. Um, for example, the king, as I've already said, is looking away from his son, the future George II, who's very much a military man. He was the last British monarch to lead his troops into battle. There's a list of famous victories, of course, uh, being held up by his side. But the king seems to be looking the other way, towards perhaps the succession of grandchildren, um, a cornucopia with loads of vegetables and fruit tumbling out of it, a sign of plenteousness and wealth. So perhaps he's saying, well, this is all very well, war and strife, but perhaps peace and moving more towards prosperity is a far better way of doing things. Normally I'd end my talk here, but there's another very interesting lady on the uh, West Wall. And it's this lady here, the mother of George I, the mother of George of Hanover, and this is Princess Sophia of Hanover. And I want to alert you to something very important, an object, an object which is round her neck. I often think that sometimes the history of places could be um, talked about, for example, in terms of objects, a history of a place um, uh, over 10 objects, or history of a place over, say, 100 objects. Of course, all that's been done before. But here's an interesting object, adorning the neck of Sophia, Electress of Hanover, are the Medici Pearls, sometimes known as the Hanover Pearls. And the Medici Pearls have quite a history from the 16th century right up to the present queen today. So how did she get them? Well, it's a case of they were given by a pope to a young Catherine of Medici when she got married at the age of 14 to Henry, who later becomes King of France. And um, the Pope gives an amazing wedding present of jewels and also these amazing pearls, which again can be seen on Sophia. There's some of the pearls, and there were, there were 80 whoppers, as they're called, seven giants, and uh, 23 pear droplets. Uh, not cultured pearls, they came along in the 19th century. These were natural pearls, a, a rich man's gift in those days. And she passes them on, Catherine de Medici passes them on to her son who marries Mary, Queen of Scots. So there's the British connection as well. Um, Mary had a very tough time and allegedly her half-brother, in fact, um, might have sold the pearls. He stole them and they were acquired, in fact, by Elizabeth I. And you can see those same pearls adorning the neck of Elizabeth I in the famous Amada portrait which can be seen, of course, hanging in the Queen's House, which is just across the road in Greenwich Park, all part of the famous Maritime Museum. Those same pearls were passed on to James I, and uh, basically uh, his uh, wife, Queen Anne of Denmark, insisted on keeping them. She, of course, is responsible, and there's a lovely story behind that, which I won't tell you about now, a lovely story about um, the creation of the Queen's House just across the road. They ended up in the hands of Queen Victoria, and um, she welded some of those pearls into the coronation crown. Later, some of those pearls were welded into the state crown, and it goes right up to the present day, where the present queen has a string of pearls that she uses for home use, as well as her state crown, of course. Traditionally, these pearls are sometimes passed on um, at wedding celebrations. So we wonder who's gonna get them next. Although already somebody has been sporting in a replica um, by the lady who plays Queen Anne, of course, in the famous and internationally acclaimed film, The Favourite. Thank you very much for being with us. And I do understand now we're ready to take questions.
Uh, that's right, Bruce. Thank you very much to both of you. That was really, really interesting. There's just so much information packed into just that one room. Um, so we're going to go to a couple of questions now. Um, I just want to check, can you two both hear me properly? Yep. Yeah, fine. Perfect. All right. So you can choose who wants to answer each of these ones. I think this one you could both answer. Could you tell us what's your favorite part or story of the site of the, or of the painted hall itself is? Well, mine you can't see, which is a shame, but my favorite lady is the spirit of architecture. She's right in the middle of the lower hall and she's pointing to a drawing of this building, but she's also drawn, pointing to the founders of the ho hospital, William and Mary. So really it's um, a 17th century PR exercise for asking for more money. So I think it's quite cheeky that the artist has put that in the painting. Okay, my favorite character I think is the lady who's responsible for the whole of the painted hall and the old Royal Naval College. So to pay homage, I think, to Mary II, William and Mary, Mary II, because as Michelle explained at the very beginning, it's a case of, it's because of Michelle, sorry, it's because of uh, Mary's impetus. Her impetus, she's the reason for the existence of this place. She was greatly moved by what she saw, wounded sailors after the Battle of La Ho. She sent 50 um, surgeons, I believe, out to help them straight away when she witnessed this at Sheerness, but she never forgot her experiences of that day. So then she got together with the famous architect, Christopher Wren, to start planning out this, this beautiful English Baroque palace, the Royal Hospital for Seamen. So Mary II gets my vote. Nice. Um, I also, you talked so much about the symbolism sort of throughout the halls. I wondered how you know all about so much of the symbolism. You mentioned, I think, a booklet that the, that the painter had put together. Um, but where do you get all of that information from? Well, very good training here. Um, <laughs> I've been here five years and um, it took three months for me to learn a lot of this. And we have uh, curators here. We have interpretation assistants as well, who put together everything that we need to learn, but we also learn it ourselves. I mean, we have lots of information here for us to learn and read about, but to be a guide here, you have to feel the place and it gets you. So you want to learn more, you want to understand more. And that's what makes, I think it's special here because we all interpret it in our own way, but the basic of, every, of all of it is because we have such good training. Okay. Um, Bruce, yes. would you like to add anything? Yes? Yes, I'd just, just like to reinforce first of all what Michelle said, which is we do have splendid training. There's lots of experts on site and when you join, um, you're given a lot of training. Um, but the good thing is, of course, people come from different directions. There's a core body of knowledge that guys like ourselves have to know, but then we can put in our own anecdotes and so forth. And that can make every tour different. So every time you come, and every tour guide you have, it could be just slightly different with a few useful, very interesting anecdotes um, placed into the tours as well. There's two tours, the site tours, which is all around the site, which includes, of course, the Tudor history as well, um, and the half an hour um, tours of the Painted Hall. But both are absolutely splendid. As regards to symbolism, there is a book, isn't there, um, uh, which is actually published, uh, sorry, written by Sir James Thornhill himself. Uh, one page is in English, one page is in French, which was the style in those days, but it explains the reason why he actually painted in those particular characters and that sort of symbolism. It's in his own words. So that's on sale in the, in the bookshop. That's amazing, actually. Um, I suppose sort of following, I think your, what you've just said kind of answers this as well, but um, one person has asked, they've said that the old Royal Naval College has just won Visit England's largest or large visitor attraction of the year award. Well done. Um, yes, well, what do you, you think makes it such a special place? What makes it a special place? Yeah. I think the whole, the whole scenario that the people, everybody that's from the groundsmen, up to the tour guides, up to our chief exec, everybody, the people in the shop, because everybody wants to be here. Everybody wants to tell the, the story of the site, the history, and everybody just loves being here. And I think that's that's the big thing, really. And that's why I think we've got this award, is because they could, they could whoever came to judge us or see us saw that everybody gels very, very nicely together. 
Uh, yes, once again, Michelle, I agree with yourself because I think uh, there's a lot of teamwork involved. Everybody pulls together and um, there's a very good vibe. There's a very good vibe from the top to the bottom. And um, that's really good news because it means we all pull together and we're all trying to do our best uh, for the most important people who, of course, are the visitors. So we try to give it a great experience. And to be quite honest, I think that um, our expertise and the way we deal with each other, it all rubs off. So, uh, no, I agree with you, Michelle. It's down to a very good vibe indeed. Um, and then one person has asked, um, just to point out the obvious, there probably normally isn't a giant spinning earth installation inside the hall. It looks amazing, um, but can you tell us what it's for? Well, it's, 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 it's a special exhibition for the Greenwich Docklands exhibition, and it's, um, was it, what was it representing? Um, Mother Earth. Mother Earth, it is. It, it's only just gone up, so we've only just seen it ourselves while we were waiting for you. But yes, so the visitors that are coming over the next few couple of weeks are going to have a very extra bit of their tour because that's going to be in the middle of the hall. The hall is usually clear. Usually we have long beds for you to, to lay on and look at the ceiling. So yes, it's, um, it looks very different today. I love the idea of the beds on the floor as well, though, to look up at the ceiling. That also sounds like a great way to enjoy the painted hall. Um, just sort of speaking about the ceiling as well, I wondered how do you maintain the ceiling? It looks like it's in lovely condition. The colors are really gorgeous. Um, yeah, how do you maintain something like that? Yes, um, well, you know, there's wear and tear in every place. And, um, no less, of course, the painted hall and in, in all buildings. I mean, the usual problems, dirt and dust build up. There's lots of windows, so ultraviolet light can cause fading and flake into the grand interior decoration. Temperature takes its toll, humidity takes its toll. So there has to be, every now and then, restoration or conservation projects. Um, what's the difference between restoration and conservation? No doubt many of your viewers will already know. But just to make sure, of course, restoration is about restoring something to as it was originally, Conservation is about cleaning up. And I've already mentioned, I think this at the very beginning of, of, of something I said, which is there's been 10 conservation projects during the 300 year history of this place. And uh, the last one began in 2012, 2013, here where we're standing now in the upper hall near the West Wall, which is that Hanoverian propaganda, uh, which I talked about earlier. And um, then there was an interregnum that about five years ago, 800 tons worth of scaffolding went up in the lower hall in the vestibule to begin the cleaning up process. Elements of restoration, of course, but mainly conservation, mainly cleaning up. And then all that scaffolding came down about two Christmases ago, ready for the reopening of the painted hall. So whoever comes now will be among the first to actually uh, put your eyes on the newly conserved painted hall. Oh, I'd just like to add that um, we did tours as well when we were doing the conservation project we had the 80 ton of scaffold and we were taking people up to the, to the top of the ceiling and giving them conservation tours they were able to talk to the conservators that were working but what they have done it is magnificent and it's we're hoping well what we've been told is that it won't have to be done again for another hundred years <laughs> wow um, we won't be around to find out the tr <laughs> truth of that <laughs> <laughs> We'll tell, we'll, tell you one, we'll just tell you one funny thing. Queen uh, Mary is in the centre of the lower hall, looking very demure in a beautiful gown with pearls at her neck. But Bruce mentioned earlier there were lots and lots of signatures up there. And there's one signature right across her chest, dated 1779. So we don't know the actual, we can't quite distinguish the name, but when the conservators were up there, it was left there for prosperity. Oh, interesting. That's a lovely story. Um, the one other thing I wondered, just looking throughout this, was um, how long did it take to paint the whole? You might have said this actually, but how long did it take to paint everything? Yes, the answer is uh, 19 years. Mm -hmm. So um, this actual block was finished by Christopher Wren in the year 1704. Um, they had to leave it a couple of years really for the plasterwork to dry out. and. Then the grand interior decoration by Sir James Thornhill and his apprentice and his helpers, that was all happening between 1707 to 1726. So a period of 19 years. Wow. I often feel sorry for Sir James Thornhill, of course, because as a little anecdote, um, he was always um, 
reaching up to paint the ceiling. So he suffered for his art big time because he suffered with back problems, shoulder problems, and neck problems in later life, as you can well imagine. And this is Muriel. Oh, we've lost um, sound. Um, it was left to dry for two years before the artist actually prepared the ceiling. And this is oil on dry plaster. Okay. Hmm. Um, I think that's probably all well, you've given us a lot to think about, a lot to process and a lot to look forward to. So I think that's all we'll do for today. You mentioned that there are two tours for people to go on. I think especially now would be a lovely time to go to be able to appreciate that lovely big globe. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us for this Tickets Awakening, Awakening Weeks experience. Obviously, if you're in the UK, you can experience UK Awakens in person. You can visit tickets.com forward slash blog forward slash Awakening Weeks for information on all of our different Awakening Weeks around the world, including this one. Um, thank you so much to Bruce and Michelle for your amazing presentation. It was super interesting to hear. Um, and to everyone for joining. Um, thank you very much. And we look forward to finding more Easter culture with all of you again very soon.